Well, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So today I will be proposing my thesis on empowering music creation with machine learning. And, and yeah, I'm co-advised by Julia McAuley and Taylor Burke Factory. So let's jump into today's talk. So um, okay. Um, so here's the outline of my uh, thesis proposal. So I will begin with my thesis. Uh, I mean, our my thesis topics, and I will um, introduce some of my preliminary results and uh, the future directions that I would like to work on in the next few years. And finally, I will talk about. Um, I will end my talk with a tentative timeline. Um, so let me begin with an overview of my thesis proposal. So broadly speaking, my research is in the field of um, music formation research, uh, MIR in short. So a definition of MIR is given as intelligent ways to analyze, retrieve, and create music. Um, well, the MIR community has been focusing on the analysis and retrieval part in the last two decades, um, people are getting more, there are more and more research on uh, music creation in the last few years. And this includes uh, different topics, uh, so including automatic composition, uh, automatic accompaniment, and also music style transfer, and broadly speaking, music synthesis also lie in this category. And we can also see that there are tons of different uh, companies that are in this field for the recent years, and including some of the big names like Google Magenta, OpenAI, TikTok, and also there are several different uh, music startups. And also like recently, uh, Microsoft also have done a lot of um, music AI uh, research. So, just to name a few. Yeah. Um, so to begin with, uh, how can ML be helpful in music creation? So first we could learn patterns and rules from big data, because you know um, humans might not be able to say, listen to all the possible music around the world, but maybe AI could do that and that could scale up and like to learn different patterns and rules um, just by observing a huge amount of data. And second, uh, it's automation. So we could liberate humans from laborious tasks. And so musicians could uh, only focus on the most creative parts of the whole uh, creative workflow. And also we could have human AI co-creation that we can make the best of the both words. So say, uh, the human will focus on the most creative parts, but there can be some uh, um, some tasks that are tedious or say um, not that creative. Then maybe we could try to automate it, uh, make it uh, automatic. Yeah. So here's a a, a typical workflow in music creation. Just to give you a hint, um, so. Um, so usually it includes steps from composition to arrangement, and then we will go into the studio or either you are working on DAW for electronic music, then we need to create the sound itself. And then we have the mixing and mastering, and then we can publish that, um, the, the product that we have. So today I will be proposing two topics. Uh, so first topic is in multi-track music generation, and the second topic is in music performance synthesis. So to be clear, um, we define multi-track music generation as generating multi-track music from scratch or conditionally, say um, given some input from the users like um, the code progression or you are given melody and you are trying to compose the full music. And for music performance synthesis, uh, we define it as uh, synthesized musical scores into expressive performance audio. 
So our goal is the final audio that we hear, and it's expressive, it's full of uh, performative decisions. And so our input is the musical scores that could contain um, different instruction. And you could also add like dynamics and like different musical marks. And we want to synthesize it into an expressive audio. Um, so there are some relevant topics. So for multi-train music generation, it's uh, related to polyphonic music generation. So polyphonic means it's single track, but there are, are multiple pitch at the same time. And automatic accompaniment and also automatic arrangement. For music performance synthesis, it's most closely related to uh, expressive music generation. So in this case, we are generating um, like uh, a music score, musical score with um, all the expressive timing and all the uh, expressive marks um, from scratch. And the second relevant topic is uh, performance rendering. Then it's, it means that we are not generating the final audio. We are generating only the expressive timing and the um, like how, how loud you want to play that note. And also it's related to audio synthesis for sure as the last step of music performances. Okay. Um, so there are different challenges in these two topics. So for multi track music generation, we have to, we will primarily be uh, focusing on the inter-track dependency. So these tracks are not independent, they are dependent on each other uh, and you know, that's the thing that make uh, multi track music generation more fun. And like, um, there are lots of things that we could explore. And we also want to uh, model the music structure. So um, for example, like paragraph and like uh, at the very bottom level, we have um, beat and measures. And also we want to focus on the usability and controllability and also how human can interact with AI. And for music performance synthesis, uh, we will be focusing on uh, expressiveness modeling and also playing style modeling. And we also aim for interpretability and controllability. And there are also some common challenges for these two tasks. They are like, how can we even get data source for these two topics? And also how we can formulate it into a machine learning problem. And finally, like, um, how we can like optimize the network architecture so that uh, the model could learn better uh, representation for the particular test. Okay, so yeah, I will go into detail later. And so next I will be talking about some of uh, the prior work in these two domains. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so yeah, so I will jump into the prior work part. Okay, so here's a list of like uh, recent and machine learning based multi track music generation systems. So, um, yeah, um, so I will be talking about two representative works. So, if you look at this chart, uh, like table, then you will see that people actually are building on top of uh, these two uh, like works. And so there are basically two directions. So I will be talking about those two. So the first direction is to use GN for uh, multi-stream music generation on the piano roll uh, representation. So um, as you can see at the right, here is a multi-track piano roll. Representation. So piano roll is a representation that commonly used in uh, music generation. So at the um, the x axis is the time, and the vertical axis is the pitch. So you can see uh, the piano roll kind of define uh, how music is played. So um, in this work, uh, we're using uh, convolutional GN to generate uh, music in this 
particular type of representation. And um, yeah, I won't go into detail, but you can see the generated sample that you can see like drum, we do have um, those drum patterns, light and the drum beats. So if you look at here, like you have all the uh, vertical dots aligned in a vertical way, and those are the drum beats. So we have like 16, uh, 16 notes and the drum are aligned on that. And also for the bass, the first track, we have the uh, mostly monophonic. And for the rest three, we have mostly chords and like pad style and like for the strings, piano and guitar. Um, the other direction of uh, multi-track music generation is to use transformer on MIDI-like tokens. So uh, at the bottom left, we have an example representation for this direction. So people are using um, like uh, try to represent music in a way that it's like text. So in the piano roll format, it's more like image, but here we are uh, representing music as a as a text, but it's more like a specially designed tokens. So you can see like we have piano and it's played with velocity 72. So velocity is kind of um, the technical definition of um, how MIDI play, how loud it play that particular note. And we have G2 for this note. So in this way, we could uh, represent music as a sequence of different tokens that specify how the music is going to be played. And then we can use the transformer model to generate basically these um, tokens as if we are generating a paragraph of text. text. Um, so yeah, so this is the, an, another way for multi-track music generation that are uh, most prominent ways for people to explore. And there are lots of follow-up work for these um, using this uh, representation. And you can also try different transformer models and design different tokens. You can even uh, include those measured chord uh, tokens into this representation. Yeah. And yeah, so the other uh, topic uh, is music performance synthesis. And there are also some uh, machine learning based um, projects, uh, prior work on that. So we will decompose into two um, most prominent components for music performance synthesis. So from the score to performance, this is also called performance rendering. Um, so basically we want to ex uh, like predict the expressive timing and also the, the loudness of that note. And then the second step is from the these um, performance, like it's still symbolic, but it did um, contain those performative uh, perspective. And then we try to synthesize audio from that uh, intermediate representation. So there are two types of work here. And I will be talking about three um, most representative works here as well, yeah. Um, so first we will talk about uh, the virtuoso net for um, performance rendering. So in this work, um, uh, they are using hierarchical RNN to render music score into expressive um, performance. So, at the right, you can see uh, it's a chart for local tempo changes and also dynamic changes. So you can see that the model is able to understand the dynamical market. So as you can see in the bottom, we have mezzo forte, crescendo, decrescendo, uh, pianissimo, and like mezzo forte. So the model will kind of like follow the instruction and then uh, adjust the velocity of their prediction uh, accordingly. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is the first word for uh, performance rendering. And there are also two words that I would like to introduce for music synthesis. Um, so the first word is use, uh, they use conditional wave net. 
and use piano rolls as input to generate the real audio. So, I mean, it's a rather uh, straightforward way. So we have a wave net, um, and then we try to condition that wave net using uh, real piano roll. And they are trained on the huge piano data set. And there's a, a, a very recent work uh, called differentiable digital signal processing. So they build uh, differentiable DSP modules. Um, and I mean, they try to have all the different DSP functions as differentiable functions inside uh, TensorFlow. So um, if you use those DDSP as the decoder, like we have harmonic audio, filter noise, and reverb, like traditional DSP components, and you can use the S uh, as the decoder, and then you can still uh, use like standard ML, like deep learning uh, package to train it. So they train the autoencoder to reconstruct audio. So this way um, we can synthesize audio given uh, the F0, the fundamental frequency, and also the loudness curves. So, yeah. So these are the prior on this two particular um, direction. And next, uh, in the next section, I will be talking about uh, some research projects that I have been working on in the past two years. Any questions so far? Cool. Um, so I will jump into it. Okay. So my there are three projects that I would like to talk about today, and they are actually closely related to my proposed thesis project. So like one is in multi-track music generation, one related to music performance synthesis, and also one for the infrastructure that could be used in both projects. Yeah, so first I will be talking about the MuseFi project, which was published in ISMIR 2020. Um, so in this project, we aim to create an open source toolkit dedicated for symbolic music generation. So here's a typical pipeline that if we want to train a uh, like data-driven model for music generation. And as we know, there are plenty of machine learning libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow for model creation, model training. So lots of different um, like possibility in using different, like the latest uh, uh, architectures like published in other conferences. Then, but there aren't many tools for data collection, pre-processing, and analysis for music uh, generation in public. Um, so that's what MuseFi is for. Uh, we want to provide these uh, fundamental routines that can be shared across different music generation systems, basically. Yeah. So here's an overview. Uh, it's a huge <laughs> graph. So we have, uh, Built-in data set management system. Um, we have uh, interface for common. Um, no, this is uh, we have data IO for the core MusePy music class. We also have interface to other um, common music formats so that we can communicate with external system like DAW or music notation software. And we also support different representation and we can, uh, so that we can communicate with PyTorch and TensorFlow uh, in a numerical format. Yeah. And finally, we have um, interface to other common music libraries as well. So this is the full overview, like uh, what we actually provide in MuseFi. Um, so with this, uh, uh, toolkit, then uh, here's a list of all the data set uh, that are currently supported by MuseFi. I mean, it's expanding and there are actually like three or four more after we publish the paper. So it's still an ongoing project. People are sending pull requests on behalf. And so with MuseFi, we can easily analyze and compare them. Like we can do lens tempo key distribution, like very simple um, 
uh, analysis on the difference of these uh, different data sets. And more interestingly, we actually did some experiment in this paper, and we show that um, first, uh, the perplexity of the trend model have a similar trend across different deep sequential models, including RN, RSTM, GIU, and transformer on different data sets. And second, we find that the perplexity of the trend models are possibly co correlated to the size of the data set, which in each category. So we have three categories here. We have multi-page uh, data sets, we have monophonic data set. We also have the two like unified and stratified. That's the um, combined data set. So you can see generally it's a uh, kind of uh, like positive correlated in the log complexity uh, over size in R. And finally, we also have a cross data set generalizability um, experiment. So we find that a model trend on a heterogeneous data set generalized better to other data sets. And so, for example, if we um, trend on LMD, it's a super huge, diverse and uh, data set that contains like various genres, then it will generalize better to uh, to all the different data sets. So at the left, we have the trend data set, and at the right, we have, at the top, we have the test data set. So, and on the other hand, if you trend on the monophonic data set, like the, uh, like M and uh, him, L, S and N, N, N M, D uh, data set, those are uh, monophonic data set, then it will not generalize to uh, polyphony data set by like RMD, Maestro, and so on, yeah. So, so this is about the first project um, we did on like uh, getting the infrastructure of um, these music generation or generally music uh, information research. Any questions so far? Um, have other people started working with your infrastructure? I mean, that seems useful even just for yourself, but... Um. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, so there are, I guess, four or three, like, works on this. I know ongoing work uh, using MuseFi. Uh, and this year is near 2021, 20, is it? Yeah, so people are using it, yeah. But, I mean, gradually, because there are another package called music 21 and people are usually using that uh, toolkit, but I found it really hard to use in um, today's machine learning era. So that's why we want to view the news by, but yes, people are uh, like moving slowly to using like news by. Yeah. So hopefully we we'll see like more works based on news by in the future. Yeah. And also, I mean, pull requests like every day on GitHub. So, yeah, people are using it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and one point to notice is that it's not uh, only for music generation, because we also have the data preprocessing thing that could be used in, like, also you can, like, if you are working on symbolic music, then you can use this data set, basically. Like it's not just for music generation. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, so I will be introducing the second project. Um, so I'll be talking about the Arranger project uh, and it was published in ISMIR 2021, which happened like on November, yeah. Just one month ago, yeah. Um, so in this project, we are interested in automatic instrumentation. So this is a new word, so we have to define it. So we define it as the dynamically assigning instruments to nodes in solo music. So there are two potential use cases. So the first is um, we can oops, we can allow musicians to play um, naturally on the keyboard, and then um, 
while having multi-track music as their outputs. And the second use case is in assistive composing tools. So um, the musician could, for example, um, uh, compose a solo piece and then later try to um, arrange it into different ensembles. Then this is when automatic instrumentation could, could help that it could provide an initial draft for that uh, particular arrangement. Um, and so here's an overview of the whole project. So the first challenge is that like, how can we even get this pair data of like um, a solo music and it's like multi-track instrumentation. So, you know, it's, it's, it's rare to have this combination. Yeah. So the idea of this project is that we acquire pair data from multi-track data set. So we do have lots of multi-track data set. And so we don't mix it into a mixture so that we could create like this synthetic uh, pair data of like solo music and uh, multi-track music. So uh, the second step is that we trend the part separation model that try to separate the parts from the mixture into the multi-track. And finally, once we have this part separation model, then we can perform automatic instrumentation by treating the mixture as the input and the multi-track as the output. So maybe we can hear the sound. So this is the input of the part separation model and also like the pipeline of automatic instrumentation. And this is the target output. Yeah, so we want to figure out like which node are is assigned to which instrument, basically. Yeah. So, um, so how can we formulate this problem into machine learning framework? So. Um, we define part separation as the process of separate parts from their mixture in multi-track music, as we just see. And so we frame this as a sequential multi-class classification block. So the input is a sequence of nodes denoted by X1 to Xn. And we also have the part labels for each particular um, note. And so the goal is that given the sequence of X1 to Xn, we try to um, predict the label Y1 to Yn for that sequence. So we are using two types of models. We have online models. That means you, you cannot look into the future. And we also have the offline models that you can look into the past and also the future. So we have LSTM, IRSTM, we have transformer decoders, and we also have transformer encoders. And these two type of model actually uh, like correspond to uh, the two use case. So for um, like uh, intelligent <laughs> keyboards that we will be using online models because the keyboard will never know what you want to play next. And for the online offline models that will be used for in uh, composing tools because at that point you, always, you already have the full composition and you want to utilize all the information you have to get a better uh, arrangement. Um, so yeah, uh, we will not jump in, talk, uh, dig into the details of the model, but we can listen to the demo. I think it's more useful. Um, so here is the original uh, instrumentation in our data set. So now what we did is we um, like, like basically make it into like a grayscale. And so we don't have all the instrument information. And then we now let our model to predict the instrumentation. And this is what the model output for the RSTM model. And that we are not giving it the entry hints. That means that uh, the model doesn't know 
which instrument are actually using in this particular case. So here's the output. And there's also another example where we give a hint on where exactly uh, each instrument are uh, played at the very first time. So here's the output of the BioSDM mod, uh, uh, bio mod. Yeah, so you can see the model did actually learn the different um, functions uh, or say groups of notes that you can see like the bass is at the bottom and you have like long chords, uh, like long chords and short chords. So the model is able to differentiate those two and assign it to different instruments. And we also try on different data sets, including um, so we start from Bach chorales and also string quartets, and we go to game music, and also here you can see the pop music examples. Yeah. So any questions so far? All right. Uh, so I will jump into the last. Uh, project that I would like to talk about. So this is called the D Performer um, Project. And this is an internship work and it's submitted to ICAST 2022. Um, yeah, so in this project, uh, we are interested in synthesizing uh, music performance. So the goal is that we would want to synthesize the audio from the row score. So we, kind of do with this in a three, three stage uh, way. So the first stage is the alignment model, which try to uh, align the row score into an, an align score. And so by align, we mean that, so initially the row score is not aligned to the waveform and that will cause a lot of problem in the synthesized model. So once we have predict the expressive timing and like how exactly uh, each note is being played in the audio, then we can like, uh, it would be much easier in the later stage. So basically the alignment model is try to predict the expressive uh, timing of each note in the row score. And then the synthesize model will uh, synthesize the aligned score into male spectrogram. And finally, this mouse spectrogram will be inverted back to the waveform space uh, by the inversion model. So it's a three-stage uh, pipeline. And so we are using Bach Violin dataset. Uh, it's a new dataset that we collect. And so we are only using Bach sonatas and partitas for solo violin. And so you may wonder why we only focus on Bach. So the problem is that what we need is uh, we want the recordings we, and we also want the musical score and we also want the alignment between them. And this will cause some problem if we are randomly scrapping on the internet because we, the, um, we don't have the actual scores. Um, so if we are using Bach's uh, work, then you know, the music scores is easy to get from like, maybe Muse score or forum and I mean, the score is easy to get. And then we can, uh, so that's why we, we use the box uh, sonatas and partitas. And this data set includes 6.7 hours and like 17 violinists because Bach is frequently played by different uh, musicians. And these are all like public recordings. And so, as I said, we need the, um, the alignment between the score and the recordings. So uh, this is how we get this alignment. Um, so we synthesize the scores using Freud's things. It's a free software synthesizer for MIDI file. 
and we run dynamical, uh, dynamic time warping on the spectrograms on the synthesized audio and the recording. And so we get all the alignment, then we can have the, uh, have the score aligned to the recording. So you can, as you can see in this figure, that the green, um, green bars are the uh, scores and the white dots are the onset. And we also have this, uh, the spectrogram of the recording. So you can see that the alignment algorithm is actually working really nice. Um, so here we'll talk about the synthesis model. So this is when we want to uh, have the notes as input and the mouse spectrum as our output. So uh, this is where it's most interesting. So we are using a transformer network. So we have the nodes, we have the pitch, onset, duration, velocity, input, and we are trying to get the mouse spectrogram output. And as we said, we do have the alignment issue here because the nodes input is in the symbolic, um, symbolic domain and the mouse spectrogram is actually in the audio domain. So that's where we uh, want to do this. So, and also like uh, this model is based on the fast speech um, model and it's for TTS, uh, text-to-speech synthesis. And, you know, in tech TTS, uh, people are working on monophonic because it's human speech. And so we try to extend it into um, polyphonic uh, for point of polyphonic music. And this is where the polyphonic mixer uh, jumping. So let's talk about this. So, um, so in TDS, we have the state expansion mechanism. So basically uh, the input is a sequence of uh, embedding and then you will try to expand each embedding into like double it or like you have three, uh, like triple it. And so that you can align it to the output. But in polyphonic case, it's a bit different. So we have onset and durations. So let's see the animation again. So we could have different onset for each particular note. We could also have different duration uh, for each particular note. To be again. Yeah, so the idea is that once we have this alignment, then we just add up or sum up across different notes and we will get the final output. And so the node embedding would be the encoder's output and the frame embedding is the decoder's input. Yeah. And there is also, so, so this way uh, we can make the state, state expansion mechanism to handle polyphonic music inputs as well. And there's another uh, um, trick that we introduce. So uh, as in music, like we, could have like very long note and, and we would expect the violinist to play differently at the beginning or in the center or at the very end of that particular note. And so we introduced the node-wise position encoding so that we could provide these positional information within each note um, so that we could have a fine grand conditioning. So as you can see here, these um, color gradients actually indicate the node-wise position encoding. So it's, uh, it's a function that, uh, it's a temporal function that will change like uh, slightly the embedding um, uh, across, uh, based on the relative position within a node. Okay, um, so demo. Um, so here are two demos. So on the left, we have the violin demo that we are talking about that is trend on the Bach violin data set. So let's hear it. Yeah, so at the top, we have the spectrogram and at the bottom is the input of uh, the model. It's a piano roll like maybe again. Yeah, so as you can clearly hear that the model is actually handling the polyphonic input really nice. 
And we also trend on the Maestro data set so that we can compare with baseline. So Maestro data set is the one that we are talking about a long time ago. Uh, we are talking about that there's a work um, using conditional um, weight that to generate, uh, to synthesize music. And yeah, so they have a huge piano data set. This is how it sounds. Yeah, so you can once again hear that uh, the polyphonic inputs are handled nicely. Cool. So any questions so far? Can, can you tell the difference between what your network produces and a human performer? I mean, um, like you. Yeah. You yes, uh, in, a, in a weird I way, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I think uh, like humans do have like uh, tiny artifacts in like playing violins because violin is super sensitive and you have the some like friction noise when you like you bow for over the strings. And those are not actually presented in the, um, the output actually. Um, yeah, that's one of the future work that we would like to talk about. So basically we are using like um, a pixel to pixel loss. Like we are using male spectrogram as the target. So we're basically comparing two male spectrograms from the ground truth and the generated one. And usually it kind of like smooths out the, um, the details. And so those attacks no, attack notes are usually missing. And also for piano, it's the same, like usually if you listen carefully to the, uh, the very beginning of each note, you can see the difference between, yeah, human and AI generated one. Yeah. I, have a, I have a really quick question. I should probably know the answer to this already, but are, are these conditioning on the score without uh, without sort of detailed timing information, or okay, are these uh, on MIDI? Um, yeah, so so this demo is on like we are assuming that uh, the express timing is given. It's given. Okay. So yeah, so the first step from score to expressive timing is handled for, in another model. But what we are showing here is that. Once you have the expressive timing, so you can see that it's aligned. So right. then how good is the model in generating the uh, aligned synthesis? Yeah. Gotcha, cool, okay, thank you. So, so just to continue the question, so the training data set was MIDI purely or that was MIDI and, and, and actual uh, acoustic recordings of these uh, Bach? Uh, um, so. well, that was uh, Bach violin or some others, right? Um, are you asking the formats of the data or like? Was your data MIDI or? or uh, oh, um, so Bach, uh, it's different. Like for Bach violin data set, we are using yeah. music XML because uh, it's more high quality. And but so it's, we, it's, we. It's still all symbolic. Well, yeah, it's paired yeah, with yeah. audio recordings. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's see. so we. So first we we uh, find public recordings and because yeah. it's box piece. So we do have those music scores. And so we download it from different sources because people wouldn't like uh, upload their recordings with the scores. So in this way, we could have the scores and we also have the recordings and then we do the alignment also. So you and that's why, we, okay. Yeah. And, so then, and then the exp expressive inflections or uh, um, besides the alignment, which is, which is oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Form, so it's, it's, it's derived from the audio as well, or uh, your express um, modifications are only on, on the timing uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, I, I see your point. Um, so yes, the, um, the, the, the marks 
are 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 ignored currently. Yeah, and so that's one of the future words that I would like to work on. So currently, the model doesn't even know like if there is a massive forte mark here or like there's a pianissimo here. And so the model is like randomly guessing based on only this um, the notes itself. So the input so, is a just, sequence of yeah. mm -hmm. Because the violin yeah. itself has a lot of expressive yeah, like, exactly. reflections yeah. In, in the way you produce the note itself, which is never notated. I mean, that's what makes one violin sound different than another. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So, so the um, question is, if, yeah, if this is kind of, because it, it, this information is in the, in the audio somehow, but um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and so the decoder could be learning that right yeah actually <laughs> yeah so uh what we observe is that actually so that's one of the way that like performance rendering is doing so you are given a score without all the marking and or say even you are given the marking how the final rendering or if how the musician actually realized that scores is it can be drastically different from the score itself and so it's like a generative modeling process and the model did learn something from the notes itself um, so you can see that uh, if you have say like basically like you are jumping around different way and also like for piano, um, we do have the velocity information. So that's why you can hear the, the, the sound. So the, mm -hmm. the first chord is like apparently louder than the, the later notes. Yeah. Right, but I mean, you, you might consider adding some sort of expressive token. Like yeah, 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 exactly. Speech. Yeah. So, and then so. the user might want to have the same uh, yeah, performance yeah, yeah. performed in a different mood. Than <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not well defined, but I, I think that could be enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what we want to do next for follow up for this project. Um, yeah. So there will be some challenge in, in uh, getting the data set. So for Bach, you know, the, the instruction is more scarce and for Potentially for other um, composers, we might have like lots of different um, instruction. And okay. so that would be helpful in like making the model more controllable and also more fun to play with. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know, so, do we have still time for, for questions then? Or, or yeah, I don't know if you, um, I don't want to hold you up on. on yeah, do you have more slides? Because I have questions all the way going to the back. I just, you know, I know that. Uh, yeah, questions. the. The lab is future work and the timeline. So maybe let's go through the rest and then we then do all the rest of the questions. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is the final part that I would like to talk about for my past work. And so for future work, I will be talking about um, like for the two proposed research projects and we're related to the questions that you have. And so, yeah, and those are the future works. Um, so yeah, um, so okay. that's that just jump into. So the first project is multi-track music generation. And first we have collected a, a huge data set from the MuseScore forum. So MuseScore is an online forum where people upload their score onto it. And we did have over 1 million musical scores in MuseXML format. So it's a very nice format. It's better than MIDI because you have all the structural information, measures, repeat, jumps in uh, music XML format clearly defined. And we also have various ensembles and jaras so that we could play with. Um, and there are the relevant data set and mostly uh, for MIDI data set. So, I mean, music XML is clearly a better format if we want to work on uh, music information research. Um, so the, the topic that I will be proposing today is, um, um, so uh, the first step is that uh, we do have lots of different ensemble in this huge data set. And so with this huge amount of data, we could train a musical uh, 
language model for each instrument, basically. So we have piano data, and then we train the piano music uh, language model, LM for sure. So uh, how we can do this? Um, one way we could do this is that we could have an autoencoder for multi-track music. So the input is the multi-track, and then we have an encoder encode into five different codes for each instrument. And then we have the uh, music uh, language model, which is trained uh, separately, uh, pre-trained uh, before and trained on all the possible um, instrument like score in the huge music score data set. And then we try to reconstruct the original uh, multi-track. And the, the, the interesting thing here is that we can actually introduce another code um, that is like, uh, act like a global conductor style code. And this code will um, kind of have the information of the global music, how it works and what are the, um, what, for example, like we have the code progression and we have the, um, for example, the melody, the theme, the motif inside this code. But for each instrument, we could have them to encode the actual uh, difference between um, that play by that particular instrument. And that's different from the global style uh, or say in addition to the global uh, content of the music. And so this way we could disentangle track dependent and track independent latent codes. And so this will lead to like a more controllable multi-track music generation system that we could have a global controls that um, control the global style, the global um, say chord progression or keys. And we also have track dependent controls that actually control how each instrument are playing. So, you know, even if we agree uh, on what we want to play, each instrument, each player would have their own freedom that you can explore within your um, possible space. So this is what I would love to work on, like uh, toward a more controllable multi-track generation. And the, the thing for music performance synthesis, um, I plan to use the Bach violin data set. We are also planning to extend it, but I mean, currently this data set, there are still lots of uh, things that we hasn't um, like handled yet. So yeah, I wouldn't go into detail. So uh, the data set actually provide us with various playing styles and recording setups. So Playing styles means that, because uh, we have 17 different players and they actually have really different uh, playing styles. Uh, even for the same piece, they will play it differently. And so we would like to uh, also handle this uh, playing style difference and also the recording setups. Some of them are recorded in studios, some of them are recorded in recital halls. And so there are also two relevant data sets, but I won't go into detail here. Uh, yeah, so the two directions that I would like to work on for this, uh, for music performance synthesis is one is like, uh, uh, as we just discussed that we want to have the musical expression into the model itself. So uh, the score did come with lots of markings like dynamic, tempo, phrasing, articulation, and all the details that you have to follow in your music synthesis model. And currently these are not handled in the project that we are talking about just. And we also want to handle the different playing style of um, um, different players. And so for this, uh, like the pl playing style handling in particular, we could borrow ideas from multi-speaker speech synthesis. So in TTS, we do have like in a Google Voice Assistant, we have um, like you can choose different speaker basically. And so it would like uh, in music performance synthesis, it would like you can pick different player, you can play pick different playing styles. So we would like to have this um, controllability in the final um, 
this is synthesis uh, system. And yeah, the other way is for technical improvement. Um, so currently, as we listen to it, it's not detailed enough and human can easily find that um, like you're playing violin, but there's no sound that you create from like the friction sounds. Um, and so we are trying, we could try uh, incorporating adversarial losses into the pipeline. Um, so there are some promising results in speech synthesis uh, already. And so basically we could have a discriminator to discriminate the generated male spectrogram from the ground truth. And this way it could uh, output more sharp and like more detailed um, male spectrogram of the audio. Yeah, and here are some broader impacts of the proposal. So these could lead to uh, democratization of music creation. So even uh, like generally public could play with the model and we could also have production of royalty free music to avoid like uh, unwanted uh, copyright infringement. We could have application in music education and therapy where, you know, um, creating personalized course for each patient or like each student is, can be super costly. And finally, we could lead insights into human AI relationship by you know, basically exploring how human and AI could co-create music instead of like uh, just like human being replaced by AI. Yeah. So it's not the case Like we could potentially uh, collaborate and use AI to um, empower music creation, basically. And finally, um, here's the timeline that I'm proposing. So, um, and I will first work on monitoring music generation and then uh, music performance synthesis. And I would like to also integrate them together because basically like once you have the monitoring music generation, then potentially you could also synthesize it into audio and then we could have like, um, like a final result that you can actually have the audio as rendered. And yeah, um, so that's all for today's thesis proposal. Thank you for your time. <laughs>